In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once, when he was serving as a priest before God, and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now, at that time of the incense offering, the whole assembling of the people were praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for I have heard your prayers. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice, rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of people of the Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him and turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready the people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this is so? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be filled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the days these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did not come out, he could not sp speak to them, and he realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me. And he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. Thanks, Scott. I told him this was his chance to make comment because his wife always has the mic and he apparently passed it up. Hey, thanks for making this part of your Thanksgiving weekend. It feels like this must be what Thanksgiving in Florida is like or something. It feels so strange, the, the weather. Uh, I'd like to start by praying, and uh, obviously if you're carrying something, you can pray for that or for them. I'm going to also pray for our friend Jack, his wife. Uh, Patsy's in the hospital up in Kalispell right now, so if you know Jack, let's pray for them. God, thanks. Thanks for this time together. Thanks for the season of Advent. Um, thanks that there's these these narratives and these lives that uh, for hundreds and thousands of years people have seen value in them and been formed and shaped by them, and so that's why we're here. And then, Lord, we do pray for Patsy. Pray just for the recovery of her body from that surgery and just lift Jack up to you and just the emotional and spiritual exhaustion of watching his wife suffer, uh, trusting that you have stuff for both of them in all of this and that they would hear your voice. Amen. So last weekend, I got to be in Billings with a couple of my boys doing some kind of errand stuff, which also gave us a chance to visit some churches, which was actually pretty fun. Uh, but I took with me one of those Advent, I suppose we've got to stop calling them wreaths, because a couple week, weeks ago everyone was like, where are the wreaths at? Like, we don't have wreaths. Candle holders. Uh, and, and if you're not familiar with those, we, we, we built those as a scattering project. They're there at the table. They're free if you'd like one. Uh, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to uh, do this as a family, if you're going to do this with roommates, if you're going to, if you're, maybe you've repurposed a small group, or maybe you're in a small group, but you also want to do this with your kids. So just feel free to take one of those if you can make use of it. They're going to disappear after this weekend. Uh, but I, I, took, I took one with me to Billings because my dad and stepmom, I suppose one of the neat COVID things is they've started watching on, I don't know if it's YouTube or Facebook or whatever they do on their iPads. So I thought, oh, I'll take one of these with, them and, and with me and give them to them. And so I did, and it was Friday night. We were sitting around the house late Friday night, and you know, I know that they're busy, and I know how this works, so I thought, oh, I'm going to put the thing together, so they kind of have to trip over it, and if you haven't done that yet, it, it's kind of an exercise in patience, because there's that horrible plastic on the candle, so I'm putting the Advent wreath together, uh, thinking about how grateful I am that we have them, thinking about how, like, when we do this next year, we'll, we'll you know, you're already kind of seeing, like, oh, we could do it different next year, and, and as I was doing that, one, one of the boys was like, so what is Advent? 
And it wasn't like a suspicious question or a critical one, it was just an honest one because quite frankly, I guess that was the first time I really realized like our family's never done an Advent before, I've never been a part of an intentional Advent conversation, so it seemed like a fair question. And if you don't know, like the, the way I like to lead through on the teaching side is like I, I will literally start studying for uh, the start of, of Lent tomorrow, so I like to stay a few months ahead. Part of it's because I'm a control freak, but part of it's also because like I, I feel like it, it's helpful for me to study stuff, experience it personally, and then set it aside for a couple months. And then when I come back to it to, to finally teach it, there's just a lot of refining that happens where stuff that you thought mattered doesn't, and, and, and there's kind of an integrity check of like, am I, did, I actually try to, did I actually live this for the last couple months? And so I've been excited for Advent for, since August, been working on this, have had a lot of energy behind it, and yet here I was on the spot uh, with, with not just my dad, but some other family there, and so I got this question, and it was like a, you know, a question you might pay someone to ask you in this situation, but I hadn't paid anybody. I was excited to get to answer it, and then, do you ever have that moment where like, you get your moment, and then you just blow it, and like the words are coming out of your mouth, and you're like, what are you saying? <laughs> you know that feeling? I think it probably happens to all of us across vocation, as well as just whatever it is that matters to you. And anyway, I was just fully aware. It didn't help that it was 11 o'clock at night on a Friday, but I just, I, I was, my words were terrible. My, it didn't make any sense. It's not that I lost much sleep over it. I hadn't really thought about it again until the next day. Uh, I took my bike with me. They live close to this. It's just about a mile and three quarters loop that it's just kind of fun to go session underneath the rim rocks. And so I was, I jumped on my bike and or went around out there and was riding my bike by myself. And those of you who exercise or run or bike or even just like to walk, you know that one of the things that we love, especially about doing this uh, alone, is the way that you're present to your thoughts in ways that you kind of never are otherwise, if you know what I mean. And so I didn't even know that I was thinking about that conversation until I was kind of done thinking about it, and I don't always do this, but I had this thought of like, I need to, I need to stop and pull out my phone and get Evernote and take some notes, because I felt like I finally had the answer. And here was my kind of three-minute answer. I think Advent, or I guess I wonder if Advent, has everything to do with identity, I, I like the phrase framing narrative. I, w- I was recently part of a funeral service where I was just reminded again that we all have framing narratives and, and so central to understanding one another is understanding like what is yours and what is mine. I wonder if Advent is all about just kind of taking a long look at what is your framing narrative? Like what is your sense of identity? What's that place from which you live? Because if you stop and think about it, to, to be human is to live in culture, which is to constantly be inundated with ideas about framing narrative and identity. I don't think it's a good thing or a bad thing necessarily. It's, it's a thing. I mean, it can be good, it can be bad. But every book you read, every advertisement that you see, every song that you listen to on the radio or on Spotify, like every class that you take, like every, every ad that you see with your eyes or hear with your ears, like they're, they're all inundating your identity especially in our world and, and in our culture, where, where we do identity by way of consumption, like so much of the way we form and shape identity, there, there's great research around the idea that the reason that now, where they're saying 50% of people 30 and below in, in the U.S. no longer identify as having any faith, and there's research that would say a big reason for that is because before this kind of current cultural moment, religion was a major way that we did identity construction, but we don't, we don't need that for identity construction anymore because, because we have Google and we have Apple and we have an endless opportunity to buy things that are ultimately about who am I and how do I, how do I project that? I wonder if Advent, and if it's true, it'd be ironic, right? Because this is not just the high holy days for Jesus, it's the high holy days for consumerism. And it's not that my intention is to attack that necessarily, but I do think there's some irony that, that we're a part of a tradition that's taken this season to really take in, what does it mean to be an apprentice of Jesus? What does it mean to follow God? While at the same time, simultaneously, the rail running right next to that is this great, great expression of identity by way of consumption. So I wonder if Advent is the opportunity to really pay attention to that, to really get intentional. And, and some of us, like post covid I realize we're not post-COVID, we're never gonna be post-COVID, I wasn't trying to make a political statement, but I just mean like, we're, we're two years into this thing almost, where it kind of feels like back to school, 
There, we used to do this thing in the end of August, like, oh, okay, it's time to start getting up to an alarm clock. It's, it's time to stop staying up late every night. In some ways, COVID has done that to us, where we're just in this endless cycle of what's my routine. I wonder if this Advent is a chance to slow down and pay attention and ask ourselves, what's my framing narrative? Which doesn't mean that, that, that I'm assuming everyone in this room is committed to Christ. That's not necessarily the assumption. Some of you aren't sure. You're not sure if you still want to be or if, or if you ever have. Some of you are here because you're exploring, because he's exploring or she's exploring. But what if we can take these four weeks to just consider what is yours? What's, what's the framing narrative? Now, again, you may not have ever used that phrase, but the reality is, and we know this, but I think sometimes Sunday is about pointing out what we already know. You, you have an identity you have a framing narrative. You may use different language. Sometimes it's hard to find, but it's there. There's a series of questions, and I think this could be a great conversation, whether you're doing Advent as a family or you're doing this with a group of friends or you're part of a group or whatever, but I think where the conversation could potentially even start is just, like, what do you laugh at? That, that'll tell you something about your framing narrative. It's a great rule of self-discovery. Like, what makes you mad? It's another one, I think. Who are your heroes? It's not just followers of Jesus who are following somebody, everybody, we're all following somebody. And sometimes it's an amalgamation of people. There's this grandparent from back here, there's this mentor, there's this coach, whatever, but who, who do you look up to? Who do you admire? Uh, like, who, who, who's, whose stream do you follow? How do you spend your money? That's a, that's a great identity question, I think. Like, if you were to actually go back and look at the, the, the trends to how you spend your money, or even how do you spend your discretionary money, or, or how do you use your discretionary time? There, there's, there, we all have one. What if Advent is a chance to really pay attention to what is it? And if you are someone committed to Christ, what if the reason the church has leaned into this, and it's less clear than Lent how long the church has observed Advent in the way we're going to, but it's, it's, it's been a bit. What if part of the value is just this identity piece? Now that would lead to this question of, okay, so what was Jesus' framing narrative? And that, that of course, is the story of Israel. And, and some of you have some familiarity, some of you none. But I think, I think the backdrop of every story we're going to look at in this series is, is, is Jesus' framing narrative. What was it? Well, he was a part of a people who, who their, their religious text opens with a God who makes creation, he makes people, he doesn't do it because he has to, but he wants to live life with people. And early in that story that started good, it goes bad. Evil enters, some would say hell enters, there's this thing that happens to God's creation, there's separation, there's divorce of, of heaven and earth, if you will. And the rest of the story, as one uh, old theologian called it, is about the hound of heaven, trying to bring reconciliation. And we explored a couple weeks ago that the story is not about a God who's sorting some people into heaven and some people into hell. That's not the story at all. The story is about a God who's trying to get the evil out of his world, the hell out of his world. He's committed to bringing it back together. And Israel's story was that God's really first iteration of that was them. That God called a guy named Abraham and, and God's plan was to be like the pipeline that God would show up in the world through Abram and his extended family. And so much of Jesus' story, because if we're gonna understand Jesus, there's this value of like, what was his framing narrative? So much of his story was about how his people didn't live up to what God had for them. And that's where this word exile comes in. It's a really, really important word, I think, as we understand Jesus' framing narrative. Because on the one hand, one way to read the text is that there was always this threat of exile in the future. So many of the prophets, so much of the Old Testament, so much of the Hebrew Bible, what it's warning them of is if you don't get it right, you're gonna lose your job. Like you're gonna get divorced. It's the same kind of idea. You're gonna blow it. The, the, the result will be culturally, you'll lose the temple, you'll, you'll lose the government. A foreign, a foreign country will come destroy you. They'll knock a lot of things over. They'll kill a bunch of people and then they'll take generally your, your best and brightest and they'll haul them back to their, to their native capital and what they'll do is they'll assimilate you into their, the, your culture and your whole identity will be gone. So the threat of exile is a big piece of this story. But I think an even bigger piece of this story, because the version of, of the story that we have is the version that was finally assembled in exile. It actually did happen. They did lose all that. They were carried into a, a land. That The bigger version of exile in the story is actually a looking back. It's a people who are in 
Babylon. They are in these foreign countries and cities. And as Walt Brueggemann, this great Old Testament theologian, he wrote this brilliant book called Out of Babylon. What he points out is that the major tension point of the Old Testament is actually this very kind of simple concern. And it's this, that when the chance to leave exile is over, nobody will wanna actually go back. That especially prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, that a big piece of what they're speaking to actually in the way that it was finally recorded is are you gonna wanna get out of exile? Do you still want that identity as God's people? And of course the way it played out in history is when given the chance, what we know is a, a very large sum of the Jewish people, they never wanted to leave. They never went back to Jerusalem. So there's two movements of exile, the threat of it coming, the, the threat that we don't actually ever want it to end once it's happened, but the third one, and I think this one's the most important to understand, Jesus. Jesus was a part of a community, especially in the Galilee. We often call this the intertestamental period. It's the period between the old ending and the new beginning, which can be offensive if we're not careful with the way we speak to that. But Jesus' framing narrative was he was a part of a people who did go back. They did have the temple. They did have some semblance of a country but every, and this is kind of the spoiler alert for the whole Advent series, every character, Mary and Joseph, we'll explore that on the 19th and on Christmas Eve, John the Baptist, we'll explore that on the 12th, uh, Anna and Simeon, these kind of obscure characters we'll talk about next week, and Zechariah and Elizabeth, every character, they lived with this mindset that though they were back in the land, they were actually still in exile. They noted that the temple was not what it should be, that their king was Herod, not, not, a, not a, a God-fearing Jewish person, that Rome still had them under their boot, and so internalized within their story is we are still in exile. Their framing narrative is of a God who is in fact still there and will come through despite what we see going on around us, and that's where we pick up, in my view, with Zechariah and Elizabeth. In the days of King Herod, just again, how offensive of a term for a Jewish person. King Herod? You want me to call this my native land when my king is Herod? In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. That's kind of like saying, like, his dad was Joe Namath, and, and her dad was Joe Montana, to use football parlance. Like they both come from very prestigious religious families. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. Now this, I think Luke's original audience would have like went, oh really? Because remember, a major movement in Jesus' day was that the temple was completely corrupt. There's a group of people called the Essenes who they like gave up on the temple. They, they weren't even gonna go back to it anymore. They were so convinced it was corrupt. Remember, Luke's original audience would have mostly, if not uh, all known, that Jesus was ultimately killed in large part by these religious people. So there's, a, there's an irony here going on. Oh, they're, so they're actually devout, okay. Like they actually care about God, okay. But then look at this. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Now I think to understand Advent is to understand and to see the, the, the paradox of this, the juxtaposition of ideas. Did you see what just happened? You have a people being faithful to God, a couple who's, who's really, really does love and is following God, and what's God doing in his part? by all outward appearance is nothing. Like you've got this theme of a, of a couple who is pursuing God and loving God and they're trying to do the right thing and they're suffering mightily. Probably nobody here needs me to say it but it's worth saying. This is a culture that, that was, the general belief was, the almost only belief was that if a couple didn't have kids, well then that was, mm, that was God smiting them. They didn't even have a concept for that that might actually be a male problem, not a female problem. What they knew is that God was punishing them. So almost like, it's like some caste system ideas, you wouldn't give compassion to them because God is kind of trying to punish something out of them. And remember, this is a culture where to not have a son, like that's, that's death. There, there were no Roth IRAs, there were no 401Ks, you didn't own real estate in hopes that the rent would, would pay your bills when you got old. 
Your retirement plan was your kids, especially male children who would provide for you in your old age. So they're in, they're in a tough way. And then this culture, as I understand it, uh, would have generally accepted that it was within Zechariah's rights to divorce Elizabeth and find a woman who could give him a son. So here's the question, why does Luke give us this story? Why is he starting the gospel this way? Or, or even more so, sometimes we ask this question of like, why, is God, why did God use Zechariah and Elizabeth? Remember, Luke is a master storyteller. Do, do you see what's going on here? There's this intentional paradox. There, there's, this, there's this formula that doesn't work. It's like, like, these people were faithful to God and God's not faithful to them, or at least that's the perception There's this layered story. Verse 13, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you'll name him John. So as Scott read, Zechariah is off in the temple. He's doing his thing, which it wouldn't have happened very often. This angel shows up and says, hey, you're gonna have a son. And he says, hey, don't be afraid. God's heard your prayer and he's gonna send you a son. What's going on here? If part one of the story is people are doing the right thing and God's not paying attention, what's part two of the story? Oh, actually he is. He heard your prayer. So, so what does Zechariah contribute to this story? I, I, think, I think central to the Advent is this question. What does Advent beg us to be good at as it relates to God? We can ask it this way. What, what was Zechariah good at doing? I mean, you might say living within this tension, but what is he good at doing? Uh, one, one more story might help. Zechariah, so then Zechariah's response to the angel. Zechariah said to the angel, how will I know that this is so? From an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you'll become mute unable to speak until the day these things occur. Now what's Zechariah going to have to do? Like if, if the early part of the story w- w- was, was about this God who wasn't faithful, but these people who were, or if the early part of the story is about a couple who is good at waiting for God, what's the next nine months going to be about? Like, I've always wondered, like, why did God silence Zechariah? Why did he punish him? Because Mary, just the next story, is like, hey, Mary, you're going to give birth to a son. And she's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm a virgin. And Zechariah doesn't go like, okay, so you're not going to be able to speak again for nine months. He actually answers her question. But in this case, Gabriel, rather, in this case, Gabriel says to Zechariah, okay, for that one, no more talking for nine months, which everybody in my life would go like, that would be incredible if that happened to Adam. What is Zechariah going to do more of? I, in my head, I don't know if this makes any sense to anybody, but I, on Friday I changed uh, the, the title to the message, which I usually don't give a lot of thought to, but sometimes things randomly occur, of it's like a babushka doll. Do you know those Russian dolls? There's like this thing inside this thing, inside this thing, inside this thing, and they're actually all the same thing over and over and over again. I think what we're going to see in the Advent stories, I, I, I know what I see in the Advent stories, is it's like a babushka doll. It's the same story played out over and over. And what is that story? If not a people given promises by God and told to do what? To wait. And what we're going to explore a little bit more next week, but it's, it's, it's embedded in this story. Does waiting imply doing nothing? Has Zechariah just been sitting around and you know, playing hockey, eating hot dogs, and raising a dog? I don't know why I chose those three things. What's he been doing? Is his waiting purely passive? And then notice now he's being asked to wait again. And then one more movement in the story. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she remained in seclusion. She said, watch this. This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I've endured among my people. What was Elizabeth good at? Like, what is this story 
Well, there's a story about these people who were in exile, and what is their job in exile? It's to wait for the king. It's, it, it's, it's, to, it's to live like no one else because you're, you're actually trusting that there's something bigger than what's out in front of you, that there's a king who will return, that God is paying attention, that God is in charge, that he does hear prayer, that he is good, despite the fact that our present circumstances say otherwise. After John's born, uh, Zechariah uh, sings a song, issues a prophecy, depends on kind of how you want, what, what culture you want to say that in. I want to read it, and it's kind of hard to follow. Uh, but, but filter for this. Uh, what did Zechariah do during the last nine months? And could it be that that nine months of waiting was to bring further clarity to what exactly God is going to do, what exactly God's promises are. We're gonna explore this more next week as we see that these guys, every Advent character, somehow lives in the tension of of what's real, like religiously and, and within government, within culture, what's real, but they somehow live in the tension between what's real and, and God's promised ideal. I think Zechariah's silence was about listening, waiting and listening and praying. Listen to his his prayer at the end. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. So wait, now we're not talking about a, a couple who was waiting for God, now we're talking about a people who are waiting for God. He has raised up a mighty savior for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. Wait, he's been promising this, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant. It's like a babushka doll. It's like the same story over and over, a people given a promise, called to wait, and trusting that God is there. Thus, He has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And now he's talking about, now he's back to, he's went from this big kind of meta-narrative back into this John, his child, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of his salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness, exile, and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. I think Advent starts on a personal note with this question. In what ways is God asking you to wait? Like what, 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 are, the, what are the areas of your life where, where, where you're called to wait? And of course, we all know waiting doesn't always mean that there's, like you're gonna get what you want. Like at some point, we all die. At some point, all of our friends die. So it's not like, we can't translate victory to like health and wealth and happiness all the time. Waiting for what? The presence of God on a big level. But in the micro, in the personal, in your own life, how are you waiting on God? And this is where spirituality and religion and Jesus can get kind of spooky because quite frankly, it's fairly subjective, isn't it? And yet probably everyone in this room uh, can pretty quickly differentiate the voice of God's spirit whispering to you versus some other voice. How is God calling you to wait? What's he asking you to wait for? And what if Advent is the season where we reflect upon to be the people of God is to be good at waiting? See, part of where this kind of blew the doors off of my own kind of worldview during COVID was this realization that so much of our suffering in these last couple years is we don't like to wait. We like it now, me more than anybody else here. And yet, and this was what was invigorating to me, like we come from a long family of people who if good at anything, 
We're good at clinging to the promises of God and waiting for those promises. What is it? A prodigal, a a son or daughter that's just kind of off in the weeds somewhere? Is it a job? Is it a a health thing? Is it a... I got to hang out with someone recently who was like five years ago, divorce, tables were, divorce papers were on the table. And I was like, okay, so how do you rate your marriage today? And they said, 9.4. What is that? I'm guessing lots of work and lots of waiting because you don't get from zero to 9.4 overnight. Is, is it, is it a, a marriage? How is God calling you to wait? And what if part of the... Part of the advantage of Advent Advent is we kind of wrap our identity around. We are a people who wait for God more than anything else. That's what it means to follow Jesus. The return of the king is still a a major theme of our lives. Jesus, uh, thanks uh, that at the very least you you know the pain of waiting. And you've not invited us into a story that's any different than the one that you've asked people to live under since the very beginning, which is living in the tension of your promises and the present moment. So God, whatever it is specific to our own journeys and stories, uh, we we just, I'm asking, Lord, that that would be a a, a topic of prayer for us in, in the next 27 days of just this building into our identity that to be the faithful person of God is, is to develop the skill of waiting and maybe even the chance to reflect on past victories where we, we did wait and you did show up. We love you, God. Amen. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about Narrate Church, find us online at narratechurch.org or look us up on Facebook or Instagram. 